What is happening, everybody? We got another UFC slate upcoming. We got in the main event, Joe Pfeiffer taking on Jack Hermanson in the main event. Going to be breaking down all those fights here for you in just a second. Go through each fight, fight by fight, with my leans, as well as how it is looking in our sim stool here at stochastic.com, which has massively helped me this year to be profitable MMA DFS. And also, I've got a couple of bets they'll throw in for you guys as we go here as well. Uh, but first, before we start, do me a favor, like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel, help support the free content around here. And then also, uh, a little bit of apologies because uh, my pick sucked last week. Not lost on me. Probably the worst slate I've ever had in terms of giving out picks on the YouTube channel. But I, I did get fairly lucky, and I ended up coming second in the $3 on DraftKings last week. So I did feel bad that I was profitable with uh, absolutely just super shitty picks for the slate. So I want to do something to uh, give back a little bit here, have a little bit of fun with this week's card as well. So let's do something below in the comment section. Whoever you guys think is going to be the highest scoring fighter priced in the 7K range. So anybody below 8K, tell me which fighter you think is going to be the highest scoring this weekend. And anybody who gets the answer right, I'm going to throw you guys into a pool of names. I'm going to do a random number generator and I'll pick somebody and I'll give out $50 to that person. So uh, we're going to have a better week this week. And also, the Sims tool, just crushing it to start the year so far because it helped me to be profitable, even though my picks generally sucked last week. But on top of that also, we've now had three slates with the Sims tool this year. In the $3, I've come in first, second, and second in those three slates. So no matter what I have done on my own end, it has helped me identify the best possible lineups I could build with the inputs that I give it. So I think that it is a very valuable tool for MMA DFS, especially to help identify some lesser duped and more unique lineups. So if you guys do want to sign up for it, use the link below in the description box. And let's start breaking down this week's slate. My picks, they can't be worse than they were last week. Let's get to it. Starting with the main event. Let's get the data up on screen here. All right, so main event here, we've got Jack Hermanson taking on Joe Pfeiffer. And I really do like Joe Pfeiffer as a prospect. There are some unknowns to Joe Pfeiffer. He's a younger fighter. We have not seen him make it outside of the second round in any of his fights in the octagon yet. We saw in his first contender series fight, he lost by a first round finish against Dustin Stolfoots. But that was a fight where Joe Pfeiffer's arm broke. It was pretty fluky. Then we saw him win by first round, uh, second round finish over Ozzy Diaz in the contender series. Then in his UFC fights, after he got the contract, first round finish, first round finish, and then a second round submission in his last fight against Abdul Razak Al Hassan. So as a result, we really don't know what Joe Pfeiffer looks like after he gets out of the second round. My gut feeling is that I think that he would still hold up and that he would still be dangerous past then, but we don't know it for sure. So the way I'm looking at this fight is if it ends in the first couple of rounds, I think that Joe Pfeiffer most likely won. If it gets extended past that, I view it as a coin flip because we don't really know exactly how Joe Pfeiffer's cardio is going to hold up. So Jack Hermanson is very live if this fight gets into later stages, like third, fourth, fifth round. Those could be Jack Hermanson's rounds. So a couple ways that I like to play this. First, for DFS purposes, for the early finishing upside, I'm getting myself to a lot of Joe Pfeiffer. He's currently my most rostered fighter. My initial set of lineups I've built here. 76% of my lineups do have Joe Pfeiffer. I do think that Jack Hermanson also is a viable punt play to look at. If we go ahead and look at my Jack Hermanson exposure, I currently have him in 15% of lineups. I might be inclined to bump that up a little bit, but I clearly do lean towards Joe Pfeiffer in the main event here. Also, something that makes me like Pfeiffer a good amount. There aren't that many payup options that really stand out to me this weekend. So with that being the case, I really do like paying up for Joe Pfeiffer. And I think there's a really good bet for this fight as well. Over on FanDuel, the first or second round KO prop for Joe Pfeiffer, it's plus 220. I think that's how he wins this fight the majority of the time is by a knockout in one of the first two rounds. So uh, plus 220 over on FanDuel, you get those rounds grouped together by first or second round KO. I think that's good value to go ahead and look at for this weekend. So uh, that's how I'm going to open up the main event. Liking Joe Pfeiffer, not writing off Jack Hermanson as an underdog, but uh, overall Joe Pfeiffer, my favorite payup option on the slate and one of the fighters I'm going to have the most exposure to. The co-main event between Dan Ige and Andre Feely. This is a fight that I think should be pretty good from a real life perspective. I don't love it for DFS for a couple of reasons. First off, I don't really think there's going to be very much wrestling or grappling involved in this fight. If we look at these two fighters, while we do see that over the course of his career, Andre Feely lands 2.19 takedowns per 15 minutes, and Dan Ige does land 1.07. That's generally not what the calling card of either of these fighters are. It's, 
it's possible that they land a takedown in here or there, but I don't think it's the most likely outcome. Neither of them are super high output on the feet either. You'll see here Dan Ige lands 3.76 significant strikes per minute. Andre Feely lands 3.86 significant strikes. So very similar for these two fighters as far as what their output is. And it's not that high for either of them. And then also you have to take into account the betting odds in this fight, which do have this fight at minus 175 to go to the judges scorecard. So if we're talking about a fight that doesn't have a lot of finishing equity, and on top of that is a fight where I don't think it's going to be super high output in a fight that's mostly going to be taking place on the feet. It does really limit the scoring upside of both Dan Ige as well as Andre Feely. So not a fight I'm super interested in. And then something else to consider as well. There are a ton of fights that are priced in the mid range that have a lot of finishing potential on this slate. A lot of fights, like one that we're about to talk about in a second in between, uh, Robert Bryce Jack and Ihor Pateria is actually minus 1,000 to finish inside the distance. So when we have all these fights that are likely to finish early, I'm not quite as apt to go to the fights that are going to go to the judges' scorecards, especially because we didn't have any fights canceled at weigh-ins today. Now, maybe I'm jinxing it right here and something will change later on the day, but with all these fights going off, there are a ton of fights to choose from, and I prefer to look at the ones that are more likely to finish inside the distance, like Bryce Jack against Ihor Pateria and... Uh, kind of odd here where we're seeing Pateria cut all the way down to 185. He typically fights at 205, and he's doing it on short notice. So we did see Pateria miss weight. Uh, still, the fight is going to go on. He's just being ducked. I think it's 20% of his purse. But most importantly, what stands out to me is what I mentioned at the top. This is a fight that is almost certain to finish inside the distance. If you guys have ever watched Breeze Check fight outside of the UFC, hyper aggressive. Fight starts. He is marching forward. He's applying pressure. He's trying to get his opponents out of there. And honestly, he typically does go ahead and do that. We now have seen Bryce check 17 and five in his overall career. And let's see what percentage of those fights have finished in the first or second round. So overall, Bryce check, we have seen him in 22 fights of his 17 wins. 11 have come by KO, one by submission and of his losses. Two of the five losses have come by finish. But then also, if you look at the recent fights that Bruce Check has had, so his last fight was July 28th, 2023. So a little bit less than a year ago, first round finish. Fight before that, May of 2023, first round finish. Fight before that, December of 2022, first round KO. And then before that, September of 2022, first round KO. Fight before that, a 17 second KO also in the first round. Obviously, you can't win a fight in 17 seconds. It lasts into the second round. So this is a guy who, especially in his recent fights over the last couple of years, has fought hyper aggressively, and he's gotten his opponents out of there fairly quickly. In the times that he hasn't, we see a fight in 2021 against Khalif Breto. And what happened in that fight? He got KO'd himself within a minute. And that is something that could happen to Robert Bracecheck in some of these fights because he is so aggressive on the feet. So I love this fight to target for DFS purposes. I lean more towards the Bruce check side because a couple of concerns I have about Pateria. Number one is being that his level of competition that he's fought hasn't been all that great. I know that we did see him fight against uh, Shogun Hua. That was his last win in the UFC, but that's a very wash version of Shogun Hua. And Pateria didn't look all that great in this fight. Something else that's also a concern, Pateria, extremely hittable on the feet. He absorbs 6.56 significant strikes per minute. On top of that, he only has a 41% striking defense. So I'm going to lean towards the Bruschek side, but this is one of the better GPP fights that we have on the entire slate. Bruschek currently in 58% of my lineups. I got Pateria right now in 19. And uh, honestly, I would be okay with going even higher on both sides of this fight and making it nearly an all-in spot. I'm very confident it finishes early. Not only is it minus 1,000 to finish inside the distance, but the current odds for it under one and a half rounds. This fight is also, let's see, under one and a half rounds. I think it was minus 170 last I had looked, but I want to make sure I have the most updated odds. Yeah, even so, this is how much that line has been steamed now. This fight is now anywhere from minus 260 to minus 305 for the under one and a half rounds. So, clearly, books are also expecting a quick finish in this fight. So, uh, Brish check by KO is going to be my official pick. Love getting after this fight in tournaments on DraftKings this week. Brad Tavares against Gregory Rodriguez. Rodriguez is super talented. Here's the problem with him. Almost never goes into fights with a good game plan. However, we did actually see him wrestle in his last fight against Dennis Tuolulin. So we saw Gregory Rodriguez land a takedown the early going of the fight. 
got top control, was able to just cut right through the guard of Tululin, who does not have much of a ground game. And then it was ground and pound, vicious elbow finishes by Gregory Rodriguez in that fight. The problem I have in the matchup against Brad Tavares, that Tavares is a guy who's been pretty durable over the course of his career. I know it feels like he's been in the UFC for forever because he has been around for a little while, but it's not like he's crazy old or anything, Brad Tavares. I mean, 36 years old, but you know, it's not like he's 40 or anything like that. And keep in mind too, that this is a heavier weight class, 185. So being 36 years old, at say like 135 pounds has different implications being 36 years old at 185 pounds. So I, I do definitely favor Gregory Rodriguez to win this fight. But the one concern that I have here is that to score well, he's kind of dependent on getting a quick finish in a lot of these fights. While we have seen Gregory Rodriguez be somebody who's a really highly credentialed black belt, great grappler, he doesn't always go to it outside of that fight against Dennis Tulalulin. So, for instance, we saw the fight against Bruno Ferreira where Rodriguez had a massive grappling advantage. Never went to the wrestling, gets knocked out in the first round against Chidi and Chikwani. Another fight where Gregor Rodriguez had a massive advantage in the wrestling and grappling department, but instead chose to stand and trade. Did end up knocking out in Chikwani in that fight, but it was probably dicier than it needed to be. Same deal against Julian Marquez. Another fight, Gregor Rodriguez, cool, he gets the KO, but didn't go in there with the most optimized game plan. So this is a fight where Gregory Rodriguez, I do pick him to win. And I think it finishes on the table. I just don't think it's the most likely outcome. And if he doesn't get a first round finish, considering all of the fights on this card that are likely to finish inside the distance and the expensive price point on Rodriguez, it's going to be hard for me to get to him. There aren't a lot of cheap fighters that I'm really liking this late. So picking him to win. And if you look at my exposures I have here as of now, I've got Tavares and Rodriguez each in sub 10% of my lineups. I really do like mid-range builds for this slate. That's where a lot of my lineups are going to be going towards. So a uh, fight I'm not massively interested in between Brad Tavares and Gregory Rodriguez. However, this next fight, Michael Johnson, Darius Flowers, another one that I love. Michael Johnson is the better fighter of the two. I have zero doubt about that. Here's the problem, though. Michael Johnson, not trustworthy. He also has a very questionable chin. We've now seen Michael Johnson knocked out multiple times, including coming off a brutal KO loss against Diego Ferreira. We did see Michael Johnson take a year off between fights, but he got stiffened up really bad in that fight against Diego Ferreira. And that's not the only time that's happened to Michael Johnson. We also saw the fight against Josh Emmett, where Michael Johnson was winning pretty cleanly the first couple rounds. Then about, what was it, like a minute or so left in the third round of that fight? Also, gets KO'd, one-punch knockout, stiffened up in that fight. So we've seen a couple of brutal knockouts that Michael Johnson has suffered. He is also somebody who is uh, at the older part of his UFC career. Michael Johnson is 37 years old, uh, also fighting at a lighter weight class. So that's what's different about the older fighters at 155 or it's like 185 that we're talking about before. So I have massive concerns about the durability of Michael Johnson as well as the decision-making because it's pretty frequent that he's winning fights early and then just makes a bad decision, ends up losing the fight as a consequence of that. Darius Flowers has like three minutes of cardio. He's going to be hyper-aggressive in those three minutes, and what ends up happening in Darius Flowers' fights, he either gets a finish in the first few minutes of the fight or he doesn't, he gasses out, and he ends up getting finished himself. So another fight that's really great to target, I'm going to lean towards Darius Flowers for a couple of reasons. Number one, he's the lesser expensive of the two, and it's just really hard for me to trust Michael Johnson. But either way, it's a fight that I think we should be playing both sides of. Let's see, what do I have as the current exposures for myself here? Yeah, I currently have Darius Flowers in 41% of my lineups. He's also not expected to be all that popular. We only have him projected for 12% ownership, so I like some of the lower ownership that we're getting on Darius Flowers as a potential contrarian play. And then also some leverage as well, because Michael Johnson's projected for 24.5% ownership. I'm overweight to both sides. I have 28% of Michael Johnson, but more of Darius Flowers, who does wind up in uh, nearly half of my lineups at low ownership. So we'll see what ends up happening with the ownership later on as we get closer to the fights, oftentimes line movement can impact our projected ownership as we get into Saturday. But as of right now, I really like Darius Flowers for lower ownership. If the field isn't going to be there, I like him. And honestly, even if this fight was more popular, I would still like getting there for the finishing equity that I see on both sides of this. Current vet, uh, betting odds is we do have this fight at minus anywhere from minus 280 to minus 360 to finish inside the distance in the mid-range. Great fight to target.
Another good one to target, Rodolfo Vieira against Armin Petrosian. And uh, another fight that I do like betting on as well, I like Rodolfo Vieira by first round submission because that's kind of his path to victory here. This is about as extreme as a wrestler versus striker uh, matchup that you're ever going to see in any sort of UFC matchup because we see a Rodolfo Vieira who's one of the best, if not the best grappler on the UFC roster is once he gets fighters to the ground, he can finish fights very quickly. The problem is that if he doesn't get fighters to the ground, he gets hurt in the stand-up very often and also pretty suspect cardio for Rodolfo Vieira. So here's how I see the fight going. Vieira either gets a takedown in the first round, is able to finish Armin Petrosian, or he isn't able to do that. And then Petrosian's probably going to knock him out in the second or third round. The reason that I still am going to pick Vieira to win, I'm not typically super high on fighters that are dependent on first round finishes, but considering the grappling advantage that we do see in Vieira over Petrosian, I only think it's going to take one takedown for him to win the fight and finish it. And Petrosian only has a 36% takedown defense. Vieira lands 3.7 takedowns per 15 minutes. I think he gets that takedown. I'm not going to say that Petrosian is uh, not playable or anything like that, but I'm getting to way more exposure to the other side of the fight. I currently have 29% of Petrosian, whereas Rodolfo Vieira in 45% of my lineup. So another fight, really good to target in the mid-range, and uh, kind of a theme throughout the slate is that how many of these fights look good in the mid-range with a lot of finishing equity. Trevin Giles against Carlos Prates. And if I'm going to pay up for a fighter who isn't Joe Pfeiffer, I'm most inclined to get to a Prates against Trevin Giles. The reason being is that Trevin Giles, we see get finished pretty frequently by high-end prospects. I'm not sure that Prates is a really high-end prospect. We're going to find out. Giles is kind of a gatekeeper in terms of determining our guys uh, are the guys fighters that have an actual UFC upside. Another thing too is that Trevin Giles, part-time fighter, part-time police officer. So he's not somebody who's going to be as committed to his fights as some of the younger counterparts that he's going up against that are up-and-coming prospects in some of these spots. So I do think the betting line is a little bit too wide in this spot where Praches is currently anywhere from like minus 250 to minus 270 on the money line. That's not something that I would touch. Uh, but still, we have seen Prachas is pretty aggressive on the feet, lands 4.81 significant strikes per minute. We saw him fight on the contender series, got a second round finish against Mitch Ramirez there. So this is a pretty good measuring test for Prachas. Is, is he somebody who really has a future in the UFC and belongs? I think he is, but I'm not totally positive. I mean, we've only seen him fight for six total minutes and was on the contender series. Contender series fighters generally could be unpredictable and often are overrated in the betting market, but I'm not super high on Trevin Giles. And another issue too that I have with Giles is a DFS option is it just doesn't do all that much. He only lands 2.97 significant strikes per minute. He doesn't look to wrestle all that often. So even Trevin Giles wins don't tend to score all that often. So I don't love the high end of the pricing this week outside of Joe Pfeiffer, but Praches is somebody who, if you do want to pay up for somebody who is not Joe Pfeiffer, so maybe you have a lineup with Jack Hermanson in it, for instance, I think Praches is somebody who's fine to get to on the high end, just not a priority for me. We've got uh, Oki taking on Kowumba. This is a late notice fight. So Kowumba is stepping on for uh, Hadzovic. Hadzovic was supposed to be taking on Oki, but I'm not exactly sure what he got scratched with. I think it was an illness he was dealing with, or maybe it was issues related to the weight cut. Then ended up him pulling out of the fight. Kowumba stepped in. And as a result, this fight is just a little bit mispriced on DraftKings because Oki was a minus 500 favorite against Hadzovic, whereas against Kowumba, the betting line's fairly tight. We've got Kowumba is right now at anywhere from plus 140 to plus 150. And then Aoki is priced around minus 180 at the sports books. So considering that he's uh, 9,500 on DraftKings, that's a really, really difficult salary to get to in a fight that's kind of close to a coin flip on the betting odds. So if I have to take one side, I'm going to go to Kowumba just because he's a punt play with some win equity, right? Only plus 140, plus 145 in the fight at a really cheap price point. But not a fight that I have all that much interest in. I'm going to take Oki to win. Kuamba is my preferred play for DraftKings purposes just because of what the price point is. So I have him in 18.7% of my lineups right now. Not all that much. He's, he's a playable punt, though. All right, let's see. What do we have next? Few fights left to talk about here. Actually, more than a few, but not the many that I like all that much. Loma Luke Bumi taking on Bruna Brasil for whatever reason. Loma Luke Bumi always trips me up. A little bit of a tongue twister if you say her name really fast. And I find that if I say her name too many times, 
in uh, in just back to back to back, I'll end up kind of uh, forming her first name and last name together, and it'll be like a, a loco loom boomy. I'll end up saying, but anyway, Luke Boomy for this week, I, I really do pick her to win. I think that she's very likely to win this fight, but the problem is she's minus three hundred on the money line. I don't think that's a bettable price, and then also. This fight is around minus 200 to go to the judges' scorecards. So considering the price point on Luke Boonmi, the problem here is that she lands 4.14 significant strikes per minute, not massively high. She lands 2.04 takedowns per 15 minutes. Decent, but not anything crazy. I do think she could have wrestling success against Bruno Brazil, who only has a 53% takedown defense. But the other problem, too, is in a fight that doesn't have all that much finishing equity— I don't think that even in a win, she's all that likely to outscore some of the mid-range fighters that I do think are likely to finish. So I'm going to fairly confidently pick Luke Boonmi to win this fight. It's just not a really appealing one for DraftKings purposes. I think it goes to the judges' scorecards. I think Luke, Luke Boonmi wins by decision. Devin Clark against Marcin Prachniow. Devin Clark's another fighter who's massively untrustworthy. He's a good wrestler. His striking is okay, not great. He is low output on the feet as well. Only lands 2.99 significant strikes per minute. He has really poor striking defense. Only defends 43% of the strikes coming against him. The reason, though, that he only lands 2.95 significant strikes per minute is because he is fairly successful at being able to land takedowns as well as push fighters up against the cage and control them, which it's a form of defense to limit the opponent's offense when he gets himself into some of those situations where he gets himself control time. It also leads to a lot of fairly boring fights. And then as far as Marcin Prachniow goes, not a fighter that I rate all that highly. He's somebody who is somewhat active on the feet, but also doesn't have very many uh, takedowns on his record. I don't know if he's actually ever landed a takedown in the UFC, Marcin Prachniow. Let's see. Prachniow has landed, yeah, never landed a takedown in the UFC. So you're really dependent on Prachniow getting himself a finish, which is live to happen because Devin Clark does have some durability issues. We've seen Devin Clark get finished by Kennedy and Sechiku. We saw him get KO'd by Azamat Mirzakhanov. We saw him get finished by Anthony Smith. He got finished by Ryan, Ryan Spann. He got KO'd by Rakic. He ended up getting subbed by Jan Blakovic. So a lot of times that we do end up seeing Devin Clark lose, he ends up getting finished. And then on the other side of the fight, as far as Devin Clark goes, he's not somebody who typically scores massively well in his fights. So another fight where I'm going to pick Devin Clark to win, but I'm not super confident. I don't trust his durability. So if I had to play one side of the fight, I'd lean more towards Prachniow, but I'm picking Devin Clark to win. He's a lower priority fighter for me. And as a whole, not a fight I have all that much interest in. Max Griffin against Jeremiah Wells. And this is a fight where Jeremiah Wells, I'm not super high on him. As a UFC fighter, he's kind of billed as being a prospect, but the problem with him is that he's 37 years old, viewed as an up-and-coming fighter, but you can't be 37 and be an up-and-comer. The good thing about Jeremiah Wells is that he puts a relentless wrestling pace on some of his opponents. He is physically very strong. He has knockout power. So you see some of the fights that he's been in. He landed six takedowns against Matthew Semmelsberger. We saw him KO Court McGee. He subbed Blood Diamond, which... I mean, Mike Mathetha, not in the UFC anymore. Didn't belong in the UFC. But either way, Jeremiah Wells got the job done there, ended up winning by submission. Uh, and then we also saw him KO Warley Alves. So there's multiple paths to upside for Jeremiah Wells. It could come by finish, or he could just end up controlling Max Griffin if he gets his takedowns going, which is a possibility. Max Griffin has okay, but not great, 69% takedown defense. So this is a fight where... I can make some cases for both sides of it. Jeremiah Wells, I have cardio concerns about if he's not able to get uh, Max Griffin out of there in the first couple of rounds. And we have seen a lot of finishing equity for Jeremiah Wells. So I do think that Max Griffin is live for a third round finish. This is a fight where both sides make a little bit of sense to get to. Uh, Jeremiah Wells is currently in, let's see, 13% of lineups. By the way, he's also expected to be massive chalk Jeremiah Wells, 34%. So that's actually not because of Jeremiah Wells himself that I come in underweight to. It's really just because the ownership is so high. There are a few fighters that we've projected to be as popular as Jeremiah Wells. He's projected for 34% ownership. Vieira at 33%. We've got Bryshchak at 31%. Joe Pfeiffer at 47%. So of the chalky fighters, Jeremiah Wells is my least favorite. I don't want to be playing only chalk on the card. So I do think there's upside for Jeremiah Wells. I just don't quite get there because of what the projected ownership is. Let's see. Couple more fights to talk about. Next one, Fernie Garcia against uh, 
Haider Emil, and uh, another fight, which was uh, taken on uh, late notice here. There was a couple, actually, I think there was two or three opponent changes for Haider Emil before Fernie Garcia stepped up and took this fight on short notice. So the current betting line, as it's settled, one that moved a lot over the course of the week because of the opponent changes for Haider Emil, he's currently anywhere from a minus 190 to minus 200 favorite. I do think it's reasonable to uh, pick him to win. But another fight where here's the issue I have with it. If we look at the betting odds, this fight is around minus 200 to go to the judges' scorecards. And then we also have two pretty unproven fighters in Fernie Garcia and Haider Emil. Actually, I shouldn't even say unproven. I'm fairly confident that Fernie Garcia does not belong in the UFC. And then Haider Emil is somebody who just more in the uh, unproven realm of things. But considering this fight is expected to go to the judges' scorecards, that's also how I see it going. I don't think it's going to be super high output or anything. We saw Haider Emil on the... Uh, contender series, 1.73 significant strikes landed per minute. It was a fight that ended up going to the judges' scorecards. He only landed 26 significant strikes. And then as far as Fernie Garcia goes, he only lands 1.8 significant strikes per minute. I can see this being a, an extremely low output fight where the winner ends up scoring like 50 or 60 DraftKings points. So not a fight that I'm super interested in getting to. Now, finally, Danil Marcos taking on Orochi Lang and... Uh, another fight here that I don't really love for DraftKings purposes. I do very heavily favor Daniel Marcos to win. I think this fight is going to take place on the feet. I think Marcos is the much better and cleaner striker of the two. He's also very difficult to hit. 69% striking defense for Daniel Marcos is a very high mark. 50% for Orochi Lang. That's more in the uh, okay, not terrible, but not great category for Orochi Lang. Output fairly similar between the two. 4.88 significant strikes landed per minute on the side of, um, why did I just blank out there? Do you guys ever do that just in the middle of talking about something and just just totally forgot that I was talking about Daniel Marcos? So that aside, Daniel Marcos lands 4.88 significant strikes per minute, 5.31 for Orochi Lang. So as far as the output goes, it's pretty similar between the two, but the big difference is the striking defense. 5.56 significant strikes per minute absorbed by Orochi Lang, 3.7 absorbed by Danil Marcos. Another fight that I do expect to go to the judges' scorecards. Most of Marcos's fights do end up going to the judges' scorecards. Another one that's minus 190 for over two and a half rounds. It's minus 160 to go to the judges' scorecards. So I'm going to pick Danil Marcos to win. I pick him to win by decision. And considering that he's a payup option on the slate, just not one that I have all that much interest in. So that's the roundup of everything that we're looking at for the slate. Don't forget, guys, if you haven't done it yet, like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you want to sign up for our Sims tool, which has helped me be super profitable in MMA, even though I have a shitty picks weeks like last week, you can sign up using the link that we have below. This is the uh, most cost-efficient Sims product that we have at stochastic.com because of the fact that there's only one MMA slate per week. So don't forget also that we've got the uh, giveaway that I'm doing here. Whichever fighter you guys think is going to score the most fantasy points and is priced below 8K, throw that pick below in the comment section. I'm going to be looking at all of them. Whoever gets the pick right could be multiple. If it's only one person, you just win out, right? If it's multiple people, I'll throw them into a randomizer, pick somebody to win, and I'll send you guys 50 bucks if you end up hitting on that. So thank you guys very much for watching this week. It's going to be better picks than last week. I guarantee it because I can only go up from here. And then next week, great card. I'm really looking forward to UFC 298. We've got Volkanovski in the main event, and I always love Volk fights. So really excited for that. And also, Ilya Teporia, super dangerous challenger. So looking forward to next week. Hope you guys tune in for that. Good luck this week. We'll see you back here next week. Peace out.